Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and turn to Psalm uh, 127. And we're continuing with this, um, uh, this theme of from the cradle uh, to the altar. And uh, we're going to be reading Psalm 127 again. And uh, I'm going to throw uh, Brother Hitt uh, for a loop here just a minute because we're not quite ready to go on to the next page and your notes. And uh, I don't know if this has ever happened uh, to these other guys that have preached, but uh, while you're preaching along, you're like, oh, man, I need to add that in there. And uh, so in your notes, you're just going to put, and this. And uh, so we're going to spend a little time on this and this uh, this evening. Psalm 127, if you found your place, if you stand together with me, please. For the reading of God's word, Psalm 127, beginning in verse number one, we'll read this psalm. And I think, again, I just cannot emphasize it enough, this very first word, except this is an exclusive idea. You can strive and do anything you want to do, except the Lord build the house. We lay labor in vain. So let me read it again. Psalm 127, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture again, that we would just uh, be reminded, Lord, that uh, striving and effort and strength and intellect these are not things that produce spiritual results. And oh Lord, we, we need spiritual results in the lives of our children and our families and our homes. Lord, and these only come about by the Holy Spirit. Lord, so I pray that you'd help us, Lord, that uh, even though there would be labor and even though there would be uh, strength and even though there would be teaching and learning, that all of it would be predicated upon the humility of surrender. That we might hear you and adhere to you so that you could produce in us and in our home and in our children that which would bring you glory. But I pray that you'd help us, that we would just be reminded of the role that you play in our home, Lord, unless we think that we are able to overcome or achieve without you. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. As we've been talking and continuing to, to look at this verse number four, as arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And each arrow is unique. Each arrow has its own strength and weaknesses and bents. And it is important, that cooperation that is necessary between the bow and the arrow. And this arrow is, has its own volition. This arrow is a part of the process. And the bow is necessary. It needs to be supported. It needs to be strung. Uh, but this arrow also has to be a part of the process. I think of Abraham and Isaac going up the mountain. And God told Abraham to sacrifice his son. And we think about Abraham having great faith to sacrifice Isaac. But think about the faith that was required of Isaac. Okay, you know how old Abraham was? Abraham was over 100 years old. There are different thoughts and commentaries that, that Isaac was anywhere from uh, 13 to 33. And any place in there, I don't care where you come on, I think anywhere from there he could have got away from a 100-year-old guy. He could have said, I don't think so, All right? And so that's a, a beautiful picture of uh, the, the obedience of the father is, is magnified by the cooperation of the son. It is, it, it, I mean, it, it brought great uh, uh, effect to the home. So lest you think, especially young people, that, listen, what can I do about it? You can fight against the process or you can make the process magnify God's glory even that much more in your home by cooperating with the process. And uh, Abraham is not a perfect man. But God was magnified, God was glorified, and even a testimony of the uh, sacrifice of God was eventually displayed through the faith of Abraham and the cooperation of Isaac. And so the error was a part of this. And so I was going through this and preaching, uh, preaching through this. And uh, last week we got home and Jackson said, uh, hey, Dad, you need to read Psalm 78. I'm like, okay, what did I do? 
He's like, no, you need to read Psalm 78. It'll help you with your Sunday night thing. I'm like, well, I appreciate uh, the help. And he meant it would compliment it, is what he meant to say. And so I read Psalm 78, and guess what? I'm preaching Psalm 78 tonight. So take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 78. There were some very encouraging things in this psalm that, that go hand in hand with this idea of, of being able to raise our children and being able to transfer to them, okay? And, and I make this statement, and I, it is a, it's a true statement, okay? You cannot transfer what you do not have. You will transfer what you do have, okay? But that does not mean that we are, we are perfect. If we were perfect, then I guess technically we could pass, for, pass down perfection. And so lest we think, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think I look at my life, my upbringing and, and my uh, childhood and my teenage years and my young adult years, and I think, oh man, I'm in trouble. What am I going to be able to transfer down to my kids? But it's not about the, when I was 13, that's what I'll pass down to my 13-year-old. It's about if God is doing a work in my heart and God is doing a work in my life, though there's mistakes or there may be failure, I can transfer the knowledge of God's working to my children if God is working. Even sometimes I go, God was working, I failed, but can I tell you, God was working nonetheless. And so there's a need to transfer. And this is what Psalm 78 says. So let me just read you. I'm going to read the beginning and then we'll look at some different points in this psalm. It says in verse number one, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable and will utter dark sayings of old, which have been heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. Showing to the generations to come, generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Now, it's very interesting that the psalm will go on to basically say, God is awesome. And the people are pretty much failures. Right? The children of Israel, they pretty much failed over and over and over and over and over again. But guess what? God showed himself through that whole process. God is awesome and gracious, and merciful. So when we're talking about transferring to our children, it's not about necessarily transferring your success. It's not about saying, son, I am awesome in the Lord. It's about God is awesome. And though I may have failed, and, and though I may have messed up, can I tell you what God has shown me over again? He showed me his mercy. He showed me his grace. He showed me his work. And I was so encouraged by that, that people that have failed in the past still have the right and responsibility and privilege of passing down the wonderful works of God to their children. Man, that's an encouragement to me. Because I don't know if you've ever failed in your past, right? I don't know if you've ever messed up. Right? I don't know if you could look back at your teen years and you could look back at your young adult years and you would have to say to your children, don't do what I did. Don't do what I did. But the fact that you're sitting in this auditorium tonight, the fact that you're here to desire to hear God's word and desire to know God's word is a reminder, not that you are awesome and have overcome your failures, but that God is awesome and has extended grace to you and extended mercy to you and has still received you, though you have perhaps deviated from the path that sometimes, though you have messed up, that you have failed, and us as failures, as weak individuals, have seen the marvelous works of God in our hearts and life, and the fact that we have failed in no way disqualifies us from transferring the knowledge of God and the wonderful works of God to our children. In fact, we, it behooves us in a responsibility to do that. And this is a great psalm to remind us that we pass that knowledge down, not because necessarily we have always been successful, but we pass the knowledge down because God is wonderful and we want them to avoid the difficulties and pitfalls and failures that we faced and the struggles that we have. And this psalm very clearly uh, designates that. Look what it says in verse, uh, verse number four. We will not hide them from our children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known under their children. Okay, and you gotta catch this, this is important. 
He says, now remember Jacob, when was the law established in Jacob? It was established under Moses, okay? And it was, it was not about the continual perfection of the children of Israel, that they never adhered to the law, or they, they never failed to adhere to the law, or they never broke the law. In fact, they broke the law before it even came down from the mountain. But it doesn't change the fact that the law was established. It doesn't change the fact that the law was given. Can I tell you, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, can I tell what was given to you? Grace was given unto you. The Spirit of God was given unto you. And though you have, may have uh, failed in that area, and, and please, please don't get me wrong, I'm not excusing our failure. In fact, the, the, the point is, uh, the contrast that is given here is, I'm having to tell you this because of their failure. Our obedience would magnify this even more, but the fact that they failed does not mean that grace and the spirit and mercy has not been extended. He said, I established a law. The law is there. And it's the law that I want, to make, I want you to make known. For what purpose do I want, uh, want to make this law known? Look what it says in verse number six. six that, that the generation to come might know even the children which should be born who, are arise and declare, uh, who should arise and declare unto their children. Okay, it says, who should arise and declare them to their children. Hey, this is, this is generational and generational. And so we're going to declare them. What are we going to declare? Verse number seven, it says, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Now, it's very interesting that he uses these words here. And the, the phrase that is used in verse number seven, that they might set their hope in God, is a very interesting phrase. Uh, the word that is used there for hope, it literally comes from the word of folly. May, basically meaning, I'm gonna jump into an area that I don't know what's gonna there. Uh, it's, it's foolish, but I hope there will be something to catch me. It's, uh, you talk about blind faith. You know who's great at having blind faith? Children. They're pretty incredible having. He says, I want them to have their hope in God. It means hope without understanding. Do your kids understand all the things of God? Do you understand all the things of God? No. And we, are, we, we want them to be able to have their hope in God even before they have understanding. This idea that, that God is so awesome, though I don't get it, though I don't understand it, man, my heart is thrilled to know God and to leap into his arms knowing that God is there. I can trust him. He says that's what we want our kids to, to set their hope in God. How do they do that? It says, but keep his commandments. So we want them to have that desire. I believe God. I trust God beyond my knowledge. And my belief in God is going to respond to my activities. Now there's a contrast in verse number eight. He says, that, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Now the, the phrase set their heart, meaning that they on purpose deviated. They on purpose deviated. Now, here's the, here's the idea. That kids have not been made aware enough, the children have not been made aware enough of the knowledge of God. They have not experienced the works of God. They have not experienced the knowledge of God. They don't have an understanding of, of the things of God to the point where they go, man, I saw God did this for me. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, but I'm gonna go this way. Now, I'm gonna tell you, I have experienced the works of the Lord. I have experienced his grace, I've experienced his mercy, I've experienced his goodness. I can make a, a responsible decision based upon knowledge of God's word and based upon God's working in my heart, I'm gonna just tell you this, when I am discouraged, I am discouraged in spite of God's goodness. When I do wrong, I do wrong in spite of the knowledge that God has given me according to his word. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so when I fail, it's because I have not set my heart on God, on that which I've been given. So you understand the difference between the position of the adult. The position of the adult is I have been taught, I have been given knowledge, I have experience, I have, I have everything from God's word. And so when I do wrong, it's because I am not setting my heart on God. 
Now, I tell my kids about the works of God and the things of God because they may not be yet in the position to set their heart on God, a, a response based upon what God has done in the past, based upon what God has done in the present and what I know God will do in the future. They do not have all that knowledge. You know what they have? They have hope. They have hope. How do you build hope of God in your children? God says, tell them of the mighty works that God has done. Tell them. Now, the blessing for that is it is not predicated on the mighty works that you have done. It's predicated on the fact of the mighty works that God has done. And to be honest, we spend a whole lot of time looking at the failure of the children of Israel and forgetting the mercy and the works and the grace of God. Did the children of Israel murmur in the wilderness? Yes, they did. What did God do? He gave them manna. Did the children uh, begin to, to, to be bitter or to be upset when they came to the waters of Marah and the bitter waters? What did God do? He commanded that they throw in a tree and the waters became sweet. And so we can, we can recognize the failures that they have, but we can also recognize, more importantly, the mighty works that God has done. And it's very important when we think about our life and we begin to focus on what do our children know us for? Do you fail? I fail. What do they know us for? Sometimes we focus so much on our failures or so much our, can I say this, our inevitable failure that all they know of us is what's going to go wrong instead of God is good. God is good. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is mighty. His goodness and his mercy is magnified by our, my obedience but it's even there in my failure. And because we, know, we so often focus on the negative of what cannot be done, we don't focus on the goodness of God. The Bible is very clear in Romans chapter number six. Romans chapter number six, that I can yield my, my members as instruments of righteousness. God has given me power over sin by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But even in sometimes in our home, we focus on the failures and the negatives. Oh, we can't do this and we can't do that. And guess who never seems to be invited to the conversation? God. And God says, it is your responsibility to pass down the knowledge to your children. Here's what it says. And might not be in verse number nine. The children of Ephraim being armed and carried bows turned back in the day of battle. They kept not the covenant of God, refused to walk in his law, and forgot his works and his wonder that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zodan. And he divided the sea and caused them to pass through, and he made the waters to stand as in heap. And in daytimes also he led them with a cloud, and all night with a light of fire. And he, uh, he claved the rocks in, in the wilderness and gave them drink out of the great depths, and he brought streams out of also out of the rock and caused the waters to run down like rivers. If I were to tell you, if I were to say, what do you think about the children of Israel in the wilderness? You know, probably the first thing that comes to your mind? Murmuring, disobedience, uh, Korah, you know, turning back from the Jordan. Are all those things true? Sure, and God points them out. But you know what God remembers from the wilderness? Water from the rock, cloud by day, pillar by night, destroying the Amalekites, manna every single morning, providing them quail, even though they ate it until it came out their nose. Provide, God remembers his provision. God remembers his goodness. And I'm gonna tell you, when you're, when you're moving on and you're beginning to, to, to want to do right and want to transfer that knowledge, you do not begin with your goodness, you begin with God's goodness. You do not begin with telling your children how good of a Christian you are. You begin with telling your children how good God is. Amen. Now I'm gonna tell you this, they forgot God's works even though they were happening all around them. Telling your children of the good works of God will not only help your children set their heart on God, well, set their hope on God, I should say, it will also help you set your heart on God. Because if not, oh, I'm trying and I messed up and oh, I know, don't do it like this and don't do, listen, we are, we are going to have our failures. We're going to have our mess ups. 
But the focus should not be on when am I going to fail again. The focus is going to be on God is good and can overcome and is mighty. And as I tell my children that, I'm going to be reminded of that. I want them to have hope in God, and I want myself to set my heart on God. It's going to be a lot easier to keep right with the Lord when you are reminding your children of his goodness. Okay? I, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. This has happened in our home where we're, we're sitting and husband and wife, we're complaining about this and, oh, no, this and that. Oh, no, man, uh, uh, this. And we're struggling with this and struggling with that. And all of a sudden, one of our kids, uh, we give them something. They're like, oh, I don't like that. And we're like, you should be thankful. I, I don't like kids who are unthankful. And my kids are, you know, like, okay, I should be thankful. And the Lord will speak to my heart sometimes and say, you know, I like children who are thankful too. <laughs> yeah, but God, you don't understand. I have a lot more responsibilities than they do. God says, you don't understand. So do I. <laughs> you don't understand the weight, the pressure that I have, that I got to provide for these children. I think I do understand that. You know, and, and I, my, the focus is, is if I cannot see the mighty works of God, it, because here's, here's the truth. The mighty works of God are happening. Amen. They are happening. You, you are not deserving of them, but yet they are still happening. They may not be happening as much as they could. Some of his blessings are being held back because of disobedience, perhaps, but God is good nonetheless. God is gracious. The fact that you are breathing is, is a testimony to the mercy of God. And so good, the good things of God are happening. The blessings of God are happening. He, he'd love to, to, to press them down, and he, he'd love to have them overflowing from heaven. And, and if sometimes we don't get as much as we should, that's because of our disobedience. But I'm going to tell you, the goodness of God is happening. The blessings, the mighty works of God are taking place. And if I don't stop in the midst of it and recognize it and tell that to my children, then they're going to have a difficult time setting their hope on God if they're not hearing about the good works of God. What is there to hope in? Who is there to hope in, Mom? Who is there to hope in, Dad? Life is tough. Yeah, life may be tough. You may be in a wilderness. Can I tell you what God's doing? He's giving water out of the rock. He's giving you manna every morning. He, he's providing quail for you. He's leading you with a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by the day. God is there in the difficult times of the wilderness and the rough times of the wilderness. And if you're so focused on what you do not have and what you cannot have and the family you could have had and the family you should have had, listen, we're all dysfunctional and there's all sorts of problems in all our families. You better focus on the goodness of God and the mighty works of God. Yeah, but preacher, you don't understand. My husband's making life difficult. My wife is making life difficult. Yeah, join the crowd. But I'm going to tell you, God's still good. And he did not say, it's amazing to me in Psalm 78, that God uses the most difficult time in Israel's history to say, tell your kids about the goodness of God. Tell your kids about the wonderful works of God. Because even though you were wandering in a wilderness, God was still making himself known and God was still being evident. Don't be like your fathers that did not set their heart on God because they forgot the works of God, but just because they forgot them didn't mean God wasn't working. And so I want you to tell your children, so they'll tell your children, so that they can have this, uh, almost this hope that is based in, uh, it, it, when it says fully, when hope is folly, it means I hope regardless of, I don't even understand it. You ever stay, be in the pool and one of your kids are on the, uh, standing on the edge of the pool and you always, dad, you tell them to jump in? I don't want to jump in. Trust me, I'll catch you. <laughs> and you wait, come on, jump in. Jump in. Trust me, I'll catch you. Guess what they do eventually, depending on who they are. Uh, Isabella is so funny. She'll say, I'll jump, but you got to get closer. <laughs> you get closer. And I'll get closer right when she jumps. I'll scoot back. And I catch her. I catch her somewhere down there, you know. Because I, I want them to be able to put their trust in me. And they look around and they see the water and they see their inability. But I want them to know that there's somebody greater. I want them to know there's somebody that has ability that they can put their hope in. They don't understand it all. 
So how do you build hope for your children in God? Tell them of the marvelous works of God. Well, preacher, it, when things get better, when things get better, I'll start telling my kids how good God is. Uh, God's already good. Things are not probably going to get better. Uh, this problem may be done with, but guess what is going to come after this problem? A different problem. But God's already good. God's already merciful. God's already working. God's already revealing. If we would just step back for a minute and look beyond uh, the wilderness and realize that God is doing a work in our heart, we would have something to transfer to our children. But when's the last time we sat around as a family and said, kids, let me tell you about the goodness of God. Let me tell you about the work of God. Let me tell you about the grace of God. Even though I failed in this area, God still showed me grace. God still showed me mercy. Let me tell you about what God's doing in my heart and what God's doing in my life. If you want your kids to hope in God, you must tell them of his goodness. Amen. And he tells them over and over again that you must tell them. The fact is, is their failure, their failure did not minimize the goodness of God. Look, as we continue in this psalm, he talks about his provision for them in verses 17 to 31. And then look what it says in verse number 32. For all this they sinned still and believed not his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. And when he slew them, they sought him and they returned and inquired yearly after God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God, their redeemer. Nevertheless, nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouths and they lied unto him with their tongues for their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. I'm reminded of a, a few things with this passage. First of all, just because we have failed does not mean we do not have the right and responsibility to pass down the goodness of God. That is true. But even in our failures, even in the things that we can look at and say, man, I failed in this area, we can pass down the knowledge of God's grace. Okay? We can point out that negative example in our own life. But here's what God is looking for. God is looking for that hope to go from hope to setting your hope in God to setting your heart on God. I want to I tell my kids about the goodness of God so that I, they can set their hope in God. But they're not going to be kids forever, are they? The only way to get them to go from putting their hope in God to setting their heart on God is to also have an example, not just of the goodness of God, but a proper response to God. God is compassionate. God is mercy. Verse number 38. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yet many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passed away and cometh not again. How often did they provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him in the desert? Yet they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. This is in the wilderness and they over and over again failed God and failed God and God was merciful. But can I remind you what happened? They eventually come back to the Jordan. They eventually make it back to the Jordan. And what did they do the second time? They trusted in God. In obedience, they crossed the Jordan. Well, I can remind my kids of the goodness of God even when I'm in the wilderness. But I can remind them of how good God is in response to my obedience when I come to the Jordan and cross the Jordan. God was, his mercy allowed them another opportunity to obey him. His mercy allowed them another opportunity. Say, preacher, I've messed up. I messed up big. How can I transfer to my kids what I don't have? Listen, you still have time. God's mercy is good. And you begin obeying God when? Right now. Start obeying God right now. Oh, my family's messed up. I don't see how my kids are going to come out of this in the right way. Don't wait. Start obeying God now. You can talk about his goodness even in the wilderness. But you want to magnify his goodness? Talk about his goodness when you cross the Jordan, when you obey God. I think it's interesting that he, co he compares them to that bow. He delivers them. He talks about the deliverance. Look what it says 
in verse number 54, and he brought them to the borders of his sanctuary, even to this mountain which his right hand has purchased. And he cast the heathen also out before them and divided them an inheritance by line and made them tribes of Israel to dwell in their tents. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High and kept not his testimonies, but turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. But they were turned aside like a deceitful bow. For they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel so that he forsook the tabernacle of Sithus and the tent which he placed among men. You say, preacher, that doesn't sound like a very encouraging place. Here's what God is, here's what God is displaying. We see the children of Israel, they obey God, they disobey God. They obey God, they disobey God. They obey God, they disobey God. But here's the constant through it all. God is good, he is merciful, he is gracious, he is patient, he delivers, he's kind. And he says, I want you to tell your kids about my works. I want you to tell your kids about my works because here's the difference between one generation to the next. I'm good to all generations, but imagine what I can do with a generation that sets their hope in me. Imagine what I can do with a generation that would set their heart on me. I'm good no matter what, but I want you to tell them so they don't have to continue that cycle of up and down, up and down, up and down. Tell them so that I can do more with them in their obedience than I could do with you in your disobedience. Man, I, I want my kids to soar. I want my kids to, to please God and honor God. And sometimes I look at my life and I see that, I see that roller coaster. And by God's grace, uh, some of that is stabilized. And I'm, I'm obeying God and obeying God. But I don't want them to see my success. I want them to see the goodness of God. Because if they put their hope in me, it's going to be a bad day. They put their hope in men, it's going to be a bad day. But it's my job to magnify the name of the Lord. Despite me. Magnify the name of the Lord. Because if God is merciful and gracious and has done mighty works amongst the wayward children of Israel, what could he do in a generation that set their hope in him? That set their heart on him? Here's basically what he's saying. Tell your children about my works so that they can soar greater than you ever did. Tell your children about my works so that they will remember it and avoid some of the problems that you had. Tell your children about my works so that they can pass down a generation, not the, a God that is good in spite of me, but a God that is magnified because of obedience. I, I don't know where you're at. You may be at the place where you have to say, God's been merciful because I've been nothing but disobedient. Hey, here's what you do. You tell your kids how good God is. Amen. Tell your kids how good God is. You may be at the place where, uh, though you've done some things, you've turned your heart back to God and, and you've returned to God and God's allowed you to cross the Jordan. He's cleared the path for some enemies in your life. And you're just like, man, I, I've done some good things, but I'm, I've also messed up some. Hey, tell your kids how good God is. And you may be at the place where you've seen dad or granddad and dad tell you about the goodness of God and the works of God and you avoided a lot of that sin. You've avoided a lot of that difficulty. You don't bear the scars because of the testimonies of your grandfather and your father. Guess what you do? Tell your kids how good God is. Well, see, my parents and my grandparents obey God, so our family's missed all that. You know why you've missed it? God is good. God is merciful. And it doesn't matter where you are, if you're the person that bears all the scars of sin, God's still good. If you're the, the person that just, man, up and down, up and down, God is still good. If you're the person that has avoided a lot of difficulty because of the testimony of your family, God's still good. And it is our responsibility to get the heart and eyes of our children on God. And it doesn't matter where I'm at in this, in this spectrum God's good. It doesn't matter if I have to say, kids, listen, I'm going to tell you, God is so good in spite of me. God's still good. If you're at the place where you say, man, I can tell you what God is good because what God has done in me. 
God's still good. Or if you're at the place, I can tell you how good God is because what God has done through me, God's still good. But you will not be able to transfer a knowledge of God from this position where, uh, based in fear. You'll not be able to transfer a knowledge of God in this position based in contentment. You'll not be able to transfer a knowledge of God in this position based on pride. Because if the focus is on man, they will not have their hearts set on God. And he says, so your children will tell their children the mighty works of God. The, good, the goodness of God. Of God. Let me go back and read that. Verse number five. Verse number four. We will not hide them from their children, showing the generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generations to come might know them even the children which should be born, who should raise and declare them unto their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. We, we sometimes fail to pass down the knowledge of God because we're too busy excusing our own activity. We're too busy excusing our own activity. It's not my fault. He, he even says some of these are dark sayings. Some of these, I got to tell you, I messed up. He said, I want you to tell him. Tell him God is good. Tell him God is, God is strong. Tell him God's works are, but preacher, it doesn't feel like that's the way it is in my heart, in my life. Listen, the wilderness journey is not because of a lack of God's goodness. The wilderness journey because, it comes because of disobedience in our own life. They wandered 40 years because of disobedience. Do you think they probably wanted it to stop after year five? Probably. But they still had 35 years to go. But God was still good. God was good the whole time. Sometimes our families get put in a place of a wilderness because of the sinful activities of a dad, the sinful activities of a mom. Our families get put in wilderness. They're like, man, it seems like there's no end to this. Can I tell you, God's still good. Amen. If you spend all your time focusing on the wilderness, you're going to miss out and forget the mighty works of God. God does not forget you in the wilderness. Yeah, but preacher, it's my fault I'm in the wilderness. God does not forget you in the wilderness. Even if you're the one that put yourself there, repent of your sins, cry out to God, ask him for his forgiveness, and his works will be real. His works will be wonderful. And guess what you'll wake up tomorrow in? In the middle of the wilderness. A preacher, when I get out of the wilderness, when I cross Jordan, I'll start telling my kids how good God is. It's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. You tell your kids how good God is and how marvelous his works are right now. Right now. I'll tell you this. God's works are magnified in the backdrop of the wilderness. God's works are magnified in the backdrop of trouble. You ever been to the, if you've spent any time and you've gone to the hospital and you've met somebody that has dealt with sickness and you walk into the hospital room and you go in to be an encouragement to them, right? You go in to say, God is good and praying for you and you walk in before you can say anything, they say, preacher, let me just tell you, God's good, praise his name. And you walk out and you're the one that's been encouraged. You're like, that is amazing. The nurses come by and you're like, that guy's awesome. You know why? Because contentment and knowledge of God's goodness is magnified in the wilderness. It's magnified in difficulty. Why did God put me in difficulty? Well, I'm going to probably tell you, probably God didn't put you in difficulty. It's probably sin, your sin or somebody else's sin. So what do I do? I'm reminded of the good works of God. Yeah, but I, I'm looking for something amazing. He, he may just give you a little manna in the morning. He may just give you a little manna at night. He may just give you a little bit of water. He may just defeat an enemy for you. But I'm looking for him to take me out of the wilderness. He may not be ready to take you out of the wilderness. But he is ready to give you good works. And mighty works is what God does. 
And instead of being amazed by the mighty works of God, you know what they did? They complained and wished they could be back in Egypt. Oh, if we could have the leeks and the garlics of Egypt, where we ate to our heart's content. Sure you did. We just need to be reminded of the good works of God. Let me give you this thought. It was because of their failure to see the present works of God that God had to tell the next generation to look back at the works of God. That generation failed to see the works of God right now. So yeah, I tell the next generation, they didn't see it, look back so you can see it. And that's what happens sometimes. Is we all, to find God's goodness, you know what we have to do? We have to look back. But that's not faith. Faith is believing and knowing that God is good right now. God is good right now. And if you open your eyes of faith, you're going to be able to see God's goodness right now. And let me just give you this thought. If we were to have your kids and my kids come up here, we're not going to do this. But if we were to have your kids and my kids come up here and say, give us this testimony. Tell us of the good and mighty works of God that your parents have shared with you lately. And uh, they'll go, mighty works at... Um, would that be named mortgage company? Would that be named financial difficulty? No, no, I'm talking about the goodness and the mighty works of God. Well, preacher, I, I can't think of any. That's because we, as the parents, are failing to see that God is doing a mighty work, that God is giving manna. I, I'll prove it to you this way. And I'm guilty of this, guilty of this. You sometime ever been too busy? You've ever been in a hustle? You ever been too busy to read God's word to your family? Oh man, oh we gotta go do this. Oh, we'll do it later. You ever been too busy to read God's word? And you think to yourself, oh man, I gotta do that. Here in my mind is what we're saying. Thank you for the miracle of manna, but I'm not gonna make use of it. If we actually believe God's word was a miracle, and a blessing, and a gift, we would put more emphasis on the good works of God and the good word of God. But manna became so commonplace to them, they started complaining about it. In fact, they said this, we have nothing to eat, and all we have to eat is this manna. We have nothing to eat, and all we have to eat is this manna. Yuck. You just said that the miracle of God was gross. You know why? It became so commonplace to them, they stopped recognizing it as a miracle. You know who can be guilty of that? That God's word has become so commonplace, has become so rote for us, that we fail to recognize it to be the miracle of God given to us to transfer his knowledge to us. So we sit down with our kids and say, can I tell you, let me show you something that God has given to us from his word. And it's just too commonplace. It, it, prayer. I'm convicted of this. Convicted of this. It seems like the only thing we teach our kids is a closing prayer. Because the only time we pray with our kids is when we're giving a closing prayer. Closing prayer before we go to bed. Closing prayer at the end of devotions. Closing prayer when we're getting ready to travel. Close in prayer, uh, you know, when we were going to uh, do something. No wonder our kids only learn closing prayers. When's the last time that we said, we've got to pour our heart out to God so that we can see and know his marvelous, mighty works? Prayers become so commonplace, so habitual in nature, that it's not a miracle. The Bible says that we can boldly go before the throne of grace into the very presence of God. When we say, okay, kids, let's pray. Lord, thank you for a day. Help us have a good night. Amen. And we wonder why our kids are not in awe of prayer. God's miracles, God's marvelous works are all around us. But we're so concerned with the wilderness, we're missing it. I was reading this going, okay, 
So what marvelous works has God done? I'll tell you a marvelous work he's done. He's given me his word. He lets me come to him in prayer. He's gracious and merciful to me. If we would recognize that, our kids would start setting their hope in God. And you want to get there to set their hope, their heart on God? First get them to set their hope in God. Tell them of the goodness of God. Uh, there was a statistic taken a couple years ago from a book by a man named Ken Ham called Already Gone. It talks about that about two-thirds of young people that are in Bible-believing churches will not be in church by their age 25. Two-thirds, 80% is what this book said. 80% of them. And they asked them a question, what, what, they, what they believed about God. And this was the, basically the statement they got back from it. They did not believe God was anything more than a fairy tale. Because the only thing they knew about God was stories from the past. It's almost like God is dead. Can I tell you, God is not dead. But as believers, sometimes we're so focused on the wilderness. Our kids, growing up in church, grow up with an attitude that God is dead. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that we would see the responsibility and the burden to pass down to our children a knowledge of you, to pass down to them uh, the knowledge of your mighty works in spite of our frailty, in spite of our mistakes, Lord, and, and, and that knowledge can be magnified by our obedience, but God is good. Let us spend time telling our children about the mighty works of God and the strength of God and the praises of God so that they might set their hope in him. Lord, over and over and over again, the children of Israel, the, the, the next generation was so enamored with the other nations because that was where the focus of their parents were, the other nations. And Lord, the world's going to steal our children if we are so focused on the world that we are not giving them the knowledge of God and declaring his goodness. Help us, Lord. Help us to magnify you with obedience, but Lord, help us to proclaim your goodness despite ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand together.